At the Launch Buddies podcast, our mission is to empower individuals with disabilities by amplifying their voices and sharing inspiring stories of personal growth, resilience, and independence. Through meaningful conversations and valuable insights, we aim to break down barriers, ignite hope, and provide a platform for self-advocacy. Together, we are committed to fostering a more inclusive community where every person can thrive and soar to new heights. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special episode of The Launch Buddies. Today, we're really excited because we have the pleasure of hosting two incredible guests who are here to raise awareness about ONH, or Optic Nerve Hypoplasia. I'm your host, Barb Beck, and I'm here with my co-host, Darian, and we're excited to introduce our guests, Joanna Mathewson and her daughter, Krissa. Joanna, thank you for joining us. Could you please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your background, especially your work in early childhood education? Absolutely. Thanks for having us today. This is an incredible opportunity for us to spread some awareness. So being here, thank you for having us. I started my journey in early childhood education actually when I was still in high school. I took okay. a class called Careers in Education, oh. and I knew right away that I needed to work with children. I chose the path that my parents were like, you won't make much money, but mm-hmm. your heart will right. be full. And so I chose the heart's going to be full. Okay. And from there, I put myself through night school while I was teaching full time kind of learning the ropes. And then when I graduated with my certificate in early childhood education, I immediately started a full-time job and quickly climbed the chain up through childcare and was offered positions as a program director and a director of the school and a curriculum program supervisor. Children are just my people. I've always been a kid person. Mm, they yeah. just come to me out of the woodworks. <laughs> <laughs> You're a magnet and for I kids. Help them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely enjoy working with children. And all my life, I knew I wanted to have five of my own. Yeah. And then I was blessed with Krissa. And hey. she changed my life. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Welcome, Krissa. We're so delighted to have you here today. And Could you tell us just a little bit about yourself and just some things like how old you are and some of your interests in general? My name's Krissa. I'm 13. Just turned 13 in April on the 23rd. And my interests are cheer. Sadly, my season just ended. Your cheer season. Yeah. And I like to play Roblox with my friends. Nice. That's a connection point for you and your friends. Yeah. I've heard a lot about that. And um and especially my friends that are far away. You're using technology to to connect with friends through gaming. Yeah, because right? I have a couple of friends that don't live in the state. Okay. One of my friends actually has my same eye condition and lives in Ohio. Oh wow. All right. So I play with her a lot and talk to her almost every day. That's excellent. All right. And how long have you been connecting with friends over technology? I'm really fascinated, obviously, with how technology can connect people and how how it can really help to use your voice, either make connections with people and foster relationships, but also we're using some pretty amazing podcast equipment to get your voices heard and your mm-hmm. experience known as well. And thank you so much for participating with us today. And it's just wonderful to get to know you a little bit. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I would like to add that the way that Krissa has met her friends, the ones affected with optic nerve hypoplasia like her, is through our Facebook group. Okay. Well, you, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yeah. your Facebook group? Our Facebook group is growing immensely every day. Optic nerve hypoplasia is the leading cause of childhood blindness. Wow. Okay. When we got our diagnosis in I didn't know where to turn. I had just joined Facebook because a friend of mine had moved away. I didn't realize how much connectivity we would have at our fingertips through Facebook. Amazing. I am forever grateful to Facebook and Meta for Mm -hmm. providing these platforms for us to connect with other people who are going through the exact same things 
that we are. Can you give us a picture of maybe what the numbers are? Um, sure. Our group started at 500, okay. and we now have 5,700 members on our Facebook group. And what about the incidence of o ONH? ONH is a rare eye condition, okay. although now it is the leading cause. There is a lot more awareness than when I started my journey trying to figure out how to navigate blindness. Optic nerve hypoplasia is an eye condition, but it also affects many other parts of the body. Okay. It comes to the point where if you are not followed properly by an endocrinologist and have your blood drawn and you go through all of the steps, that there is a chance for fatalities. And in our community of ONH, if you do not have the three key doctors to help you on your journey, there is the chance that you could lose your child without knowing how to properly help them. Wow. So getting that information to people who are Absolutely. just in that phase of getting a diagnosis, starting that journey, knowing that there are people out there that have taken more steps than they have at that point um, on the journey, what a powerful opportunity to connect with others and to feel like you're not alone. Right? right. And to make sure that we're making a difference. Yes. We have a lot of folks that are in rural areas. Okay. Um, we're a global nonprofit. We're not just the United States. We decided to take on the entire world. And that being said, we have to have, um, you know, admins in the UK and mm -hmm. admins in Australia and people that can help filter for Lo hyper local resources. We have folks in China that can't come over to the United States and are choosing stem cells and things, which has no proof of actually helping okay. rejuvenate optic okay. nerves. There's Getting the of, word out about those things. Right. Incredible. Yeah. It right. There's a lot of confusion, especially still in the medical world, because it was first and foremost called Demorsor syndrome, mm -hmm. and then it was called septo optic dysplasia. But now the actual term that all medical professionals should be using is optic nerve hypoplasia. Okay. And right, that's so very the, confusing as well. Just, is it septic optic hypoplasia? ONH and SOD are the same thing. Those are the acronyms. So the confusion here with septo optic dysplasia is pretty much the diagnosis that also means your child was born with brain abnormalities. Oh, okay. Because of the large spectrum of ONH and how everyone is affected differently, the confusion between the words has caused a lot of confusion in the medical field, and it's causing a lot of misdiagnoses. I see. So get your second opinion, get your third opinion, and listen to your gut. Okay. Definitely. Big, huge deal with a mom. Listen to your gut. And I know that you've probably had many of those types Absolutely. of moments in your life. So thank you for sharing that. Carissa, from your perspective, can you share with us what it's like living with ONH and how it might affect your daily life? At school, it definitely affects me because sometimes they, I have to have enlarged papers and some of my teachers forget to do that and it annoys me. Of course, yeah. Especially, yeah. Especially I've had bad luck with science teachers last year and this year. They just don't get, like, they're always trying to fix things, and they just can't fix this. So they just don't put in large papers in. And it just upsets me that they don't really care that much. And they must know already, right, about the accommodation that you need to access the curriculum. And yet maybe they forget or they just don't take the time to uh, make that extension to what you may need. And so... Um, I can see where you would feel very frustrated and tired of advocating for yourself often. I don't know, Darian, if you have felt any of those things because you have, you went through school and had um, accommodations that you were able to get through your IEP. Um, but can you share a little bit about maybe some of those experiences that you might have related to Carissa and the frustration of, of trying to access curriculum when people should just be on board with be your legally board, of binding course. document. Definitely. Yeah. With your legally binding document. That's well said. Thank you for saying yeah, that. Definitely. 
So as an individual who um, faces anxiety and high-functioning autism, it's extremely difficult when people do not understand you. I've experienced that, Krista, where people don't, it doesn't register right away, which I get, but to everything takes time. It's just a matter of being willing and uh, acting on understanding what one deals with and providing the right accommodations for them so that way they can thrive in the community, they can thrive in the classroom, they can thrive in their education. And then from their education into adulthood, it's just accommodations for people who deal with these things, certain struggles that may hold them back. I had a follow-up question, Carissa, about your experience with teachers or whoever else is in your community, either at school or in cheerleading, wherever that is. What has been, I guess I should say, Who has been your greatest champion outside of your family? Can you describe somebody that has been your biggest champion to come alongside you? Is there somebody that comes to mind? Like at school. Could be at school or a coach. What about Emma? Yeah, Emma, she's great. Can you tell a little bit about Emma? She is my TVI. She's amazing. That's a teacher for the visually impaired, a TVI. Okay. And she does O and M with me. She used to do my braille, but O and M is orientation and mobility. Yeah. It helps practice getting around safely, whether that's using a mobility cane, a white cane, okay. or just using your the vision that you have, your functional vision. Yeah. I've been doing braille since I was three. So. Oh, I was gonna ask you that when you started learning braille. So I just got sick of it, honestly. Okay. And it and I just felt and it was just me and one teacher and just one room. So it was weird to just not have anybody else in there and it was getting um to something that I didn't really want to do anymore. And it was and I was getting bored of it. So one thing to explain too about Braille is that Braille is a code. A lot of folks will say Braille is a language for the blind and visually impaired. But Braille is actually a code. It's a code of six cells that are represented through the numbers one through six. And you can make every single letter of the alphabet with those different keys. It looks like a very old, a Braille writer looks like a very old typewriter from the 1900s. Yeah. It's very heavy. And Krissa has become, she taught me how to load Braille paper. Because I have had a really hard time. Braille paper is a little bit thinner than stock card. And it's always on a manila color. And when you are able to key in the letters that you would like to Braille, it makes a very loud punching sound. Mom, I just wanted you to know that I've been showing you how to do it since I was about five. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Very long Kristen knows the Braille writer. It's a Perkins Braille writer. She knows it way better than I do. But I try. Okay. Well, we're talking about technology and how things have changed over time and learning that. One of the things that I wanted to call out, Carissa, and what you were saying in the, in that experience of learning Braille with with one other person, your I, mobility specialist or what? No, it was specifically your... I, the teacher that would teach Braille is called a teacher for the visually impaired and gotcha. they must be certified. So it's a TVI. TVI. Okay. All right. And that is very exclusionary kind of practice, right? Absolutely. Where, yeah, you you need to learn those things, but to pull you out of and, and work with you for so long when you feel super isolated, I can imagine what that feels like as, as a young person just wanting to be part of the rest of the community, right? The way that it's changed me from having not having Braille anymore, I just feel non-isolated okay, and feeling more impacted with my friends and being like more social with them. So that's helped me a lot. And I've only had one bad experience is when I was one of my teachers that I was reading backwards, even though if you read the word or the letter wrong, they'll say, hey, can you read that again? So that's what they said. And I was like, Okay, I'll go back. And after that, she goes, my sub goes, do you have dyslexia? Oh, so she discovered that? No. Or, no, Chris that's is not dyslexic. Okay. And her Thank braille, you for clarifying. Her braille teacher knew that. 
It was actually a very pivotal point in learning Braille for okay. us. As in order to learn, you, you have to feel comfortable. You have Absolutely. to feel like you have a relationship with your teacher. Yes. A student-teacher relationship is so important. And this woman, she just, it's time to retire. Let's just say that. Okay. okay. So she's not enjoying her job as much. She got frustrated with my daughter. And literally, this woman asked, are you dyslexic? Okay. okay. Now, as a parent with a student on an IEP, we know that dyslexia would be included in that legally binding document. So for her to go and mock my child for making a simple mistake, I just, I couldn't hold in my mama bear. I had to have a conversation with her to let her know that it was absolutely inappropriate and that a diagnosis is a very pivotal point in anyone's journey. Of course. You don't just get to call someone out and say, oh, you must be dyslexic. At this point in Chris's education, it is clear that she is a very smart and capable child. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it just wasn't the right setting for Krissa. And it was and very, she it was hard. That, my heart stopped. Of, it like, felt rude, right? Yeah. Definitely. Definitely rude. I'm really sorry that happened. And I'm sorry that I think a lot of people have experiences in the field as you go through. Sadly, it's up to us to educate other people. And but when it happens to you and you go through something that makes you feel more excluded, less included, labeled again for something that you shouldn't be labeled with. Right. And I think that just we have to get better. Yeah. Right. And after that helped it happened, I just felt uncomfortable near that teacher. Yeah, of course. And any other time that I was around her. Like I felt she was going to make another rude comment. Yeah. Chris, I'm really sorry that happened. I really am. I think that hurts all of our hearts to hear that story. We're going to take a little bit of a break. Uh, we want to hear from our sponsors. Great. And then we will be right back with more from your story and your experience and how we can build community. Enjoying the Launch Buddies podcast, we're all about celebrating the voices of self-advocates who bravely break down barriers. Speaking of brave advocacy, let's take a moment to recognize our sponsor, SDES Functional Academics. SDES offers a comprehensive curriculum, training, and consultation for students with disabilities. Their Steyer Fitzgerald program for functional academics has been refined with input from educators and families, achieving great success in classrooms nationwide. As Launch Buddies, we understand the challenges of finding the right education. With SDES by your side, you'll feel confident and empowered to provide an exceptional education for every child in your program. Visit SDESWorks.com to learn more about the Steyer Fitzgerald Program for Functional Academics and make a real difference in your teaching. Thank you, SDES, for your commitment to inclusivity and accessibility. Now let's dive back into our conversation that's so captivating with our amazing launch buddies. All right, we're back. And uh, during the break, we were talking a little bit about science teachers and how. All right, we're back. And during the break, we were talking a little bit about your experiences and reflecting and thanking you for being so vulnerable and sharing what you have about your experiences with people in school, adults that we wish knew better about how to approach students with disabilities or conditions with your vision. And, and you were saying, yeah, it you just know, as far as scientists are right. trying, we're trying to cure things. That's right. What, what did you say? Yeah, scientists are always trying to find a, a cure. A solution. A solution. Mm -hmm. They're always looking to, they're science. They want to help find the answer. So I found that science teachers are the hardest to get through to because they're constantly looking for how to make it better, right? And, and whatever happened last year and this year, can you explain that? Because I don't remember Yeah, all of it. Yeah. But Probably would. Yeah. You had all of the conversations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, what was I'm that? pretty much a professional at hard conversations now. Um, right. Just going back to science, right? Scientists yeah. are amazing, but sometimes they are so focused on trying to find a cure that they forget about how things affect. Yes. So if it doesn't directly affect you, sometimes it's over your head. And I understand that, but I also need you to realize as a teacher that you're here to serve your students' needs. 
And an IEP is a legally binding document that right. includes specific accommodations and modifications so that my child can learn in a world that's set up for visual learners mm -hmm. as a blind student. It's not hard to do that. It's very easy to read directions on an IEP and follow them. However, as an educator myself, I understand you kids. Mm -hmm. You have other students that have other needs as well. And you need to be making sure that you're meeting those needs. But when my child is the only kid in the class that is assigned homework because she can't keep up with her labs, it's inequitable. It's oh. rude. And I won't stand for it. You At should. curriculum night, this teacher told me, your child, your student will never have homework in our class. All the work is done here in lab. That's how science works. So when I got an email from the teacher saying, I'm sending home Chris's lab homework, I was flabbergasted. Oh. I wasn't even able to reply to the email before he decided to take it upon himself to send the homework home. Then when my child attempted to do the homework because she was told to, although homework is out of her IEP, we don't accept homework. We accept tutoring. He scored her paper and she failed. Oh, come on. And then he said, we'll give her a chance to redo it if, no ifs. This is not an if situation. You will give her a chance to redo it and you will no longer assign homework to my child. See, in, the, in that arena, she was just set up for failure. Exactly. And so it's like you failed the student, but she didn't have the accommodations to be able to perform these this homework assignment to, to perform this right. in this subject she wasn't she didn't have what, what she needed she was just just throwing into something and this i don't know what to do with this i can't do anything with this because i don't have what i need to do this and despite the fact that they had promised that that they were going to provide the right kind of like education and not sending homework home and they right. did the opposite it just sounds a lot like i'm going to discrimination Exactly. But, yeah. But also, you can say the word. Of course. Discrimination. Yeah, absolutely. And all, but also, the other thing I was going to say, too, was the saying they're going to do something, but they don't follow through with it. Right. And that's hurtful. It is. And Krista has become quite an amazing self-advocate. There you go. When she uses her loud, confident voice and it's not heard, I will mama bear from left and right field. You won't even see me coming. But I don't want that to happen. I am teaching my child to navigate life that is made for visual learners as best as I can. And all I ask for is that each person follows the rules. I think there, that's like a yeah. law. It's a law. For and sure. I have unfortunately had to start making civil complaints and we have rights. We have rights in the school district under the IEP. When my child graduates, she has rights under the Adults with Disabilities Act. My child will be protected. She will be protected. She will go on and be an adult and be protected then too. So it's just baffling that these adults that are here to educate my child are not accommodating. Yeah. So I think uh, one of the things that is so powerful that I think, Carissa, that, that you are learning with your stronger voice, your strongest voice, that becoming your own best self-advocate is so amazing. And you have an incredible model in your mom to um, advocate for your needs. Sadly, we don't have professionals that are totally understanding what, what a legally binding document it is, an IEP that what's written in there needs to be carried out. Daily. Daily. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Darian, what's our next question that we have? Joanna, as a mother, you've been on a unique journey alongside Krissa. Can you tell us about the challenges and triumphs you've encountered in supporting her? Absolutely. As I said before, I always just wanted to be a mom. I wanted to have five children. And I, I was Jeez. blessed with Krissa. And I learned really quickly that Krissa was my five kids. Okay. I needed to learn how to support her in all the areas that I had no idea how to do. And I think like most moms or folks, just people in general that receive a diagnosis, there is this mourning period. I had, I really, I mourned the loss 
of my daughter's vision of what I thought I would be having. I had dreams, of course, and I quickly realized that I needed to adapt to this new life. And after, I don't know, it was probably about a year of me just trying to figure out what am I going to do? Financially, it was very stressful. We didn't have, we don't have a lot of financial support. And unfortunately, health insurance is fabulous, but they don't cover a lot of eye specialists. Okay. And eyes are extremely expensive. Okay. After figuring out what to do financially, I was able to get enrolled in early child, or I'm sorry, in early intervention, which is a birth to three service. When you find out your child has a diagnosis, an agency will come into your home and provide in-home instruction and help you learn how to work with your child. Yeah. Um, that was life-changing for me too. The early intervention strategies yeah. and, and opportunities, those services are so critical Yes. to yeah. get to get a head start in the right direction, to get oriented to okay, your new life. This is my new life. What is this experience going to be like today? And in the next next steps, how do I you know, get to that community around me? Yes. So, so when we started in home therapy, Krista was just nine months. And I had been told the very worst when she was diagnosed. I was told she wouldn't thrive. There was a chance she would never hold her head up. There was a chance she would never feed herself. There was a chance she would never walk. And we beat all the odds. That kind of goes back to the confusion of SOD and ONH. Because when you are on the spectrum of optic nerve hypoplasia, you can have brain abnormalities. You can have endocrine issues. And a lot of other things can accompany this, not just your visual aspects. Okay. So after we did the blood work and we found out that Krista had no endocrine issues, um, it was a little relieving for me to know that she would be growing normally and she would be thriving. Krista hit all of her milestones at typical times. She, I literally wanted to wrap her in bubble wrap when she was learning to walk. As you can imagine, oh, not being able to course. see, I was very concerned, but she was fearless. She <laughs> climbed the climbers. She climbed the wobbly bridges. Thank you. She was a fearless album. <laughs> fearless. <laughs> We're huge Taylor Swifties. It's all true. Right. But just to see how amazing she had done all the things that she was supposed to do. I'm like, these doctors are whack. I'm going to go find a second opinion. It seems like that is so common that people get all the worst case scenario. Yes. Oftentimes. And getting that second opinion, I'm glad you stated that because encouraging other people to, that, okay, go check, check another source, right? And oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Even if it is Children's Hospital, which is the absolute best place in Seattle to be, mm -hmm. their vision department just wasn't for us. Okay. The scientist there, the lead scientist, the lead ophthalmologist, he would, he really wanted to guinea pig Krissa. He wanted her to do visually evo evoked tests, which involves strapping pads to your baby and having their brain be stimulated and unstimulated through visual aspects and trying to read brain waves, which is extremely difficult in children. So, I just opted out of all of that. It didn't feel right. It didn't sit well with me. Again, back to your gut, your exactly. gut feel as a mom. Yes. Right? And then they said, let's try a trophene, which is an eye drop that you can put in your good eye that makes it blind. That would help your weaker eye over time. I didn't feel comfortable doing that either because I knew that this was an optic nerve issue. This wasn't a retina issue or something that could perhaps be corrected, a cataract or things like that. When you have the nerves, the optic nerves of your eye connect to your brain. You and I have typical optic nerves, so we have millions of optic nerves, fiber optic nerves connecting our eyes to our brain. ONH has maybe 100 nerves connecting. So every case is very different, and the deterioration of optic nerves is in utero, okay? When you are growing your baby, our eyes develop between the 
12th and 16th week of gestation. It's usually, we would say, around the 14th week. By the time you have your 20-week ultrasound and your gender appointment and things like that, they would be able to tell you how your child's optic nerves are just by seeing them on an ultrasound. Now, as of 2015, doctors are diagnosing ONH in utero because of that. And it's giving parents a whole new shed of light and hope because when their baby is born, they already have the resources they need. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. And I love the that concept last time we were talking about how hope plays such an important part. And that early diagnosis, the early intervention, the opportunity to navigate your path with community is huge and very hope giving, right? Carissa, I would love to hear a little bit from you about your achievements and dreams for your future. So what are some of the things that you're really proud of that you've recently experienced? What are you hoping for the future since we're on that topic of hope? Definitely is one thing is that sometimes if the, like what mom was saying about like how I was born and stuff, if once I was handed a small print paper that was about 12, 12 point font. Yeah. Okay. Chris, and, uh, Chris's preferred font is 20 point font. Okay. And that sometimes when that happens, I have to call mom and say, hey, this isn't, they enlarged this, but they put it to 12. This isn't okay. So sometimes I even have to call her and tell her because it's not right. I think that's one actually a big achievement is that using your voice to say what you need and doing that, reaching out to your mom or or to whoever, that is one amazing achievement that you're becoming a great self-advocate. And and for the future, some of the experiences that you'd like to capitalize on, some of the things that you'd like to explore. Can you talk a little bit about that? Do you remember what you told me about what you would like to build for folks with disabilities? Oh, yeah. I was going to build a coffee shop with a Braille, like... Braille menus? Yeah. Oh, wow. And because a lot of restaurants don't have that. A lot of restaurants are lacking on their Braille menus. Okay. And if the, you're a restaurant owner and you hear this, I can help you Braille a menu. That'd be amazing. <laughs> Boy, could you Braille a cup so that Absolutely. when you're like yeah. holding uh, the uh, cup in your hand, you, you get some messages or you get the... Yeah, you, exactly. It could yeah. just say, have a sweet day. Or anything like that. Anything like that, that a blind person could naturally pick up and read and feel connected. That's what she wants hey, to do. Hey, coffee shop owners, do you hear this? You know, know. you may have a future... Employee on your hand, helping you you shout out to Becca's Brew. Yes, (laughs) yeah, we love them. And I know you're wearing a sweatshirt. Your mom's wearing a sweatshirt that say that that says the future is inclusive. Has a big heart over her heart. And and what a great sweatshirt. I love that. And another one, disability is not a bad word. I appreciate that so much, Darian. What do you think about that message? What I. From looking at this, it's people like you both who are going to help to make a difference, who are going to, who are going to put, who are going to put a word out and it's going to sink in. It's just, our world has some waking up to do in areas, yes, especially with understanding certain individuals with disabilities. Absolutely. And it's just, it's incredible. I appreciate you saying that, Darian. It's incredible. Just these words and the, and the shirts, the shirts you guys are wearing, it's just it just goes to show that of what the world can be and that we can do better than where we are now. And being an inclusive community is going to be great for everyone. Bringing life and light to those areas that really need to be illuminated, enlightened, taught. And yes. you're doing that through your website. Yeah. As we wrap up here, can we talk a little bit about the website that you have? Yeah. You did mention your Facebook community but you also have a website that I wanted to highlight some of your work around that. Can you talk about your team that you're working with yeah. through that as well? Going back to Facebook, when I did my research, I just typed in optic nerve hypoplasia. Okay. And a few different groups came up. The National Federation for the Blind came up, but I felt I just 
I really wanted to focus on the diagnosis itself, not just blindness. So after I connected with Dallas, who is the president and CEO of our ONH Awareness Nonprofit, her son is just a few years older than Krista on a different spectrum of ONH. Three years older. He Three. just turned 16. Right? He just turned 16. That's okay. right. We definitely have our children connect with each other so that they can talk about similar things that they're struggling with and their triumphs and things that work for them and things that don't. Krista met her best friend Peyton through optic nerve hypoplasia awareness. And I've known her since December 27th or 28th. So that's a holiday, too. That's fun. Um, She's making that their friendship day. Oh, I love that. That's so good. And when I get in, not in large papers, I know I can go home and I can call her and I can talk to her because that same thing happens to her and it's actually worse for her. Her, one of her teachers doesn't know what enlarged papers are and her aide forgot how to use the thing that blows up the Okay. So that's just super upsetting. To have somebody that that understands and is walking that journey alongside you for your friend, I think that's amazing. I love your community that you're building for those reasons mm-hmm. and for so many other reasons to get the word out and yeah, one for of the things educating about the, the community. Our website mm-hmm. that we really wanted to make a big impact for was a hyper-local community connector. Okay. So once you join ONH Awareness, you can actually right now waive the suggested donation fee of $25 mm-hmm. with the code, all caps, thank you, at the payment one site. Word, one words. word, thank one word, one word, thank yeah. you. You can go in there and click on the family locator. You can type in your zip code and it will pin you with other families that are in your area so that our children can make connections with each other. Wonderful. Because don't know what it's like until you're directly affected. So having these children build these relationships early on, I'm hopeful they'll last a lifetime. That's what we're going for. Yeah. Yeah. And what was I going to say? Probably something about pay pay. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. So the first time we called, I was like, who is this girl? And then a few months later at the end of the call, we were saying, I love you. Bye. Oh, that's that's so amazing. It's such a testament to your friendship that you've built. The love that you share, the respect that you have for each other. I love that so much. And I have so much respect for both of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Yeah. Thank you, Joanna and Krissa, for sharing your insights and experiences, not only about ONH, um, but also about the importance of community, school inclusion, school information, IEP, the importance of um, having those plans in place and followed through. And uh, what a remarkable journey of learning Braille um, and having a future plan of working in a coffee shop to serve other people who and are living life um, with similar um, vision impairment and opportunities to build community. Another job is maybe making... Are you talking about sensory clothing or... What is that? Like a poppet shirt? That'd be really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you're onto something there. Yeah. Um, what were you thinking of, though? Making braille writing because I also want to work at a makeup store oh, or wow. a clothing store. Yes, and adaptable clothing. That's a big go. thing. Yeah, okay. and maybe making like the prices in braille numbers or saying what it is in braille numbers, like where the stopper is when the first piece of clothing is like the stopper right there help it right there help people shop yes i love that adding braille descriptions to things yeah we're very descriptive people Uh, we've become very descriptive people which is helpful and just one more thing too i just wanted to say thank you so much for having us and Mm -hmm. i have i've decided to just go out on a limb and help all the folks that I can. So I've become board certified in special education through the National Association of Special Education Teachers. Wonderful. That's a long sentence. That's a long sentence. (laughs) It is. I really enjoy making sure that our families and their students are getting all the services that they need. The special education in public schools is very confusing. If, If there's anything that I can do to lighten anybody's load, 
I, I started volunteering with the ARC as a parent partner in, in IEPs and decided with the ARC, I wasn't allowed to say my piece. I just had to support the parents. But now I can say my piece. Okay. And I'm getting through to a lot more educators as an advocate, helping represent families with all sorts of learning challenges and disabilities. Wonderful. And is if there's is there an email address that people could reach out to you oh, yeah. if if they'd like to continue really? the conversation or find yes. similar supports? Or if someone was listening to this podcast and they know someone directly affected with ONH or blindness, yeah. I am also the representative for Washington State for the parents of blind children through the National Federation of Feder- of the Blind. Yeah. I'm constantly coordinating with moms who are just getting diagnoses and providing support and helping be their sounding board while they figure things out, you can always reach me at Joanna, J-O-A-N-A, at O-N-H, awareness.org is my email. And my my own personal disability page is called IEP Like a Mother okay. on Facebook. That's great. <laughs> and I'm slowly turning my advocacy into a business so that I'm able to be a voice for those who aren't able to be their own voice. I love that. Thank and you so much. another thing is, is once I was in the car with my dad and he goes, me and your mom are so proud of you for pushing through public school and not having to go to private school because public school is something lucky that you can do as a blind person especially because some teachers just don't get it. And the fact that you can push through that is amazing. I think that's a great achievement that you just highlighted. And I would really agree with your dad on that. And I love that he gave you that that encouragement, that message, and something to anchor to. We want to celebrate you and all your achievements and just encourage you to just keep on moving on, keep on breaking down those barriers. I know, Darian, you've um, been doing that for a, a very long time and uh, continue to be a champion for other people and a motivational speaker for uh, people who have similar experiences. So thank you so much. I just also want to thank our Launch Buddies community for joining us in this important conversation and that we should continue to raise awareness and support one another. It's important and it just, it's incredible the amount of good that comes out of people who deal with struggles because we all do we do but when we look at each other's strong points and we work together to work on the weak points who knows there are many possibilities there really are that wraps up today's episode remember no matter the challenges we face we're all champions in our own stories stay tuned for more empowering discussions in the future and until next time Keep soaring to new heights and launching the dreams and plans for your future. Thanks so much.